being an entrepreneur is not refining the art of PowerPoint presentation writing. Seriously, you know, a lot of people think about how, where's the deck, what's the pitch deck. Being an entrepreneur is the ability to use your energy, resilience and focus to, to create demand and customers for your product or service. So it's to be able to sell, you know, and, and that's really, really important. This is the Ideas Lab podcast, where you can learn from great creative and entrepreneurial minds how to turn your ideas into original businesses, books, and brands. Because in a crowded world, it pays to stand out. This is your host, John Williams, best selling author and founder of the Ideas Lab London. If you dream of creating a successful startup, then this episode of the Ideas Lab podcast is for you. Stephen Hess is founding director of the Startup Leadership Program here in London. SLP, as it's known, is one of the world's first startup incubator programs and now has one of the largest not-for-profit entrepreneurial communities in the world. So Stephen is a great person to tell us exactly what makes the difference between startups that succeed and the 70% of startups that go on to fail. Stephen, thanks very much for making the time to speak with me today. A pleasure. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, you're the founding director of the UK chapter of the Startup Leadership Program. And I'd love to know a bit. Now, I've taken part in the Startup Leadership Program, so I know it's good. But I wanted to know a little bit about how successful it is, because you've had a huge number of people pass through this program. Yeah. So... Originally, uh, the Startup Leadership Program was founded by a good friend uh, called Anupendra Sharma in Boston back in 2006 uh, with a cohort of seven. Um, Over the last 13 years, the organization has grown from having educated seven through to nearly 4,000 men and women in, in 19 cities around the world. Um, our entrepreneurs have raised uh, around $700 million of venture capital, creating 1,900 companies. And over uh, over that time, uh, 60 have been successfully sold. So it's a high portion of successful exits. It's a high portion of capital raised. But I think more importantly is there are 4,000 men and women around the world, each of whom have a world view of what it means to be an entrepreneur. Um, and that's, that's, that's really important. And I hope we'll come back and chat about that in a little bit. Yeah, no, that's, that is an amazing results. So there an awful lot of people have ideas for startups and want to get a business going. Not very many of those survive. So you've got some great stats that you just mentioned. Um, and what's interesting about the startup leadership program is when people are starting a startup, particularly a tech startup, they obsess about the idea about what is this thing we're going to do, you know, how will this be unique and so on. But the startup leadership program is not really about that, is it? How would you describe it? It's about the it's about the founder. Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about the world of startups, the world of the the emerging cool world of being an entrepreneur. It, it tends, the narrative tends to be around companies that start up and companies that raise money and a couple of standout go-to examples of what it means to be a Silicon Valley, ra- Silicon Valley or a Silicon Roundabout entrepreneur. But on the whole, what's really important is to recognize that many successful entrepreneurs are not successful with their first venture. Some are, but they're often successful with their second or third. So just focusing on the startup is already introducing into the system an increased level of risk because the chances of failure of that startup are higher than if you focus on the entrepreneur who will have a greater chance of success because he or she might succeed second or third time round. So that's that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, you know, when 
SLP was started, there were no other really structured uh, development programs for entrepreneurs. You know, Y Combinator didn't exist. 500 startups didn't exist. There was very little entrepreneurial education in any of the universities. And while being an entrepreneur was kind of cool, it hadn't hit the mainstream hipster cool that we see now, where you have some of the brightest students from school or brightest students from university leaving and considering going into a uh, into the world as an entrepreneur rather than enjoying a blue chip consulting business or a software business or a tech business, or whatever it might be. So suddenly what we see is being an entrepreneur is a real career opportunity. And what's interesting about that is of the around seven or 800 organizations just in the UK, all of whom purport to provide support for startups, very few of them actually focus on the entrepreneur. And it's the entrepreneur who's going to make the startup successful. Very few of them really focus on trying to, uh, in an in a supportive and non-competitive way, look at trying to nurture and grow the entrepreneur and the startup. There always tends to be some sort of competitive element in it. So you get into a program, you're fighting your classmates for resources. And, you know, what I've learned over the last you know, 10 years or so, just running the uh, SLP program in the UK is, okay, being an entrepreneur can be really cool. Uh, it's full of ups and downs, but it can also be really lonely. And many of the people you talk to about your ups and downs or your doubts often don't share the same experiences as you. So you have very little common ground and ways of connecting and sharing those experiences with them. So finding other entrepreneurs that you may have a friendly competitive relationship with but whom you trust is really important for building the foundation for being a successful entrepreneur especially if you have little or as yet to be realized life experience where you're kind of jumping straight in and it's something you're just starting for the first time uh yeah and i think that's part of what makes slp so special and i think for anyone who's listened to this who wants to create their own startup, it will probably be quite difficult to shake them out of this obsession with their idea. But if they accept the premise that they're going to need to work on themselves as well, which I think most people would at least see the sense in, you've what kind of qualities do people need? I've seen you've list three qualities in particular that an entrepreneur needs in order to be successful. I think the... So there's around about 200 entrepreneurs have been through the program in the UK. And if I look at the standout entrepreneurs who have gone on to grow uh, fast growing, thriving businesses or who've go, who have realized maybe that entrepreneurship is not for them and they've kind of taken a step back and gone into, you know, maybe an associated area. So we've had fellows go through the program, realize their startup isn't going to be what they want it to be. They've left, they've joined a VC firm. And we've had fellows who've been through the program who are now partners in a VC firm investing in fellows who have their own startups going through the program. So it's quite a nice uh, uh, complete circle. But what I've noticed is there are kind of three, three, fa- three I guess, factors, three ingredients that make a successful entrepreneur. The first is energy. The second is resilience. And the third is focus. Um, Energy is really important, obviously, because if you don't have it, nobody else is going to give it to you. And if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to give it to any of your uh, employees, your co-founder, your customer. You need to have energy to keep going. And that also requires you to be resilient because let, let, let's be honest, starting a business is not easy. Most people are uncomfortable with it. And because they don't know it, they tend to reject it. So I'm leaving my job to go and do a startup. I'm leaving my university now to go and do a startup. There's no promise of a, of a monthly salary. Everyone is going to tell you no. 
don't do it. It's not a good idea. You must be stupid. You're crazy. And you need to have the resilience to resist that. And not only the wall and barrier of being uh, realizing your idea, but also people not wanting to buy it. So when you've built your business and you have put it into the market or you're ringing somebody up on the phone to try and get them to buy your product or service, everyone is going to say no. And that is going to make you feel very downhearted. So you need to be really resilient in order to go, this is the right thing for me and it is also the right thing for you. You have to keep going. Um, And the third is focus because if you have limited energy and you have resilience, you need to be able to focus on where you're going to spend your time and efforts in a way that is laser sharp because there are loads of distractions in this world. And in the world of startups, there are increasingly uh, more, increasingly, increasing numbers of meetups and groups and uh, kind of drinks. And it's becoming kind of a social area where what you're invited to and who, who, what, what podium you're taking are increasingly important. But really, what you need to be focusing on is your business and how you're going to get your startup working. So you have to absolutely focus on that. And that means saying no to a lot of things. But it also requires you to be really honest about what is important to you to make your business successful. And then to be certain that when you're clear about where you're focusing, you won't get distracted. So energy, you have to have it. Resilience, people are going to say no. And focus, where are you going to spend your time and energy? Absolutely key. And it's those broad, soft skills that tend to differentiate successful entrepreneurs from entrepreneurs who are following the crowd and ultimately you know, may come through any program or any life, start, life cycle of a startup and then go off and kind of try and find a job at the end of it. It's, it's quite important to have those three characteristics. Yeah, I thought that was a good point about focus because you could almost have a full-time job, unfortunately an unpaid job, going to networking events and and courses and so on. Now, the good thing about SLP that I like, it's actually in the evening, isn't it? So uh, if you still do that, yeah. So you can actually do your job or you can you could even have started your startup and then go along in the evening and, and still take part in SLP. So it doesn't take over everything. On the question of energy, um, if, if I'm somebody who doesn't have a great deal of energy, so, I mean, the interesting thing is I've been thinking about writing a software app for a while. So this is a live question for me, but I'm sure there'll be lots of people listening who are thinking of, starting an app or a startup or or some sort of business uh, i don't have an enormous amount of energy does that rule it out for me i mean do you mean i've got to be like fit and energetic you know so i can do long work days you know i think that's um that's that's a really good question because it's made me think that people may consider energy to be the um the the premise of um you know gordon gecko greed is good you have to get out there get up in the morning keep on going um you know sleep is for wimps but realistically that's not the case energy is the amount of um focused time you can bring to particular tasks in your life and if you are clear about what the task is and you can bring your attention and focus to that task, you can, you can undertake any number of them, um, but it has to be focused and structured. So throwing energy and enthusiasm and staying up 18 hours a day with caffeine and liquid food is, is probably not the ideal way of building something that is sustainable and something of quality. It may be an easy shorthand for being a strung out but energized entrepreneur for a short period of time. But let's not forget that being an entrepreneur is not a fad, a short term lifestyle shift. It is a it is a it is a very um, challenging but rewarding 
uh, way of living your life. Like I've I've set up two businesses. I've worked in co- large corporates, and you know you you can spend similar levels of energy in both. You know you can travel a lot with a large corporate, or you can get up early and you can work late. Um, but realistically, do you get as much stuff done? It's it's where you can focus your energy is where it makes a difference. So back to your software question, if you have the idea for a software, then you should allocate some time on a daily or a weekly basis just to think about how you would frame it, how you bring it to life. What would it really mean? And then once you've got something that you've written down or drawn, take it to some people that might be the alpha customer for your software idea and see what they think you know that's that's what's important doing something is what's really really important if you don't do something nothing is going to happen but you need focus and energy in order to do something and that's a really important point you made there which is i think you know i meet people who say like their first question is how do i get funding rather than and you're laughing at this too because this seems like a logical thing right okay if you want to start up and you want to be you know the next facebook or something you need funding before you even start and you forget that of course facebook was written in 30 days by mark zuckerberg alone um more or less um while he was still a student and that's the story of an awful lot of startups um and and the point you made about like i could flesh out my idea for this software and then go along and show that to people and go, is this something you need? Does this solve the problem that you have? And the, the earlier you do that, the better it seems to me. But do you, when people come to you and say, like, I've got an idea, how do I get funding? What do you say to them? I say to them, what is your idea and why should somebody buy it? Why should somebody spend money on it? I think... You know, there's uh, unpacking your questions, kind of a couple of things in it. One is, is funding important for launching or starting a startup? Yes, of course it is. <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, the kind of startup ecosystem began back in Silicon Valley, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you could go to a VC uh, firm or individual with an idea and he or she or they might fund it. But as time has passed and as the cost of prototyping, developing and deploying an idea has reduced, increasingly what sources of capital, whether they be VC, angels, family officers, fools, fans, families, whatever it might be, increasingly those sources of capital have looked at de-risking their investments by asking the entrepreneur to almost have a business set up and functioning with revenue before they even start putting money into it. So that's a function of the cost of setting up and deploying a business reducing and a function of the capital becoming smarter about what it invests in. So I think those two factors have shifted the market somewhat. But perhaps also is more important is the the. The smart money in being an entrepreneur is not chasing the money. It's chasing the smart. And the smart is building something that people want to pay money for. Seriously, you know, when someone comes, I have an idea, I want to raise some money. I go, okay, well, could your customers fund this? Could your suppliers fund this? Why, Why is the default position to always think about venture capital. And that is, I think, a it's a narrative in the industry that doesn't really do the VC funds any favors, nor entrepreneurs any favors. And that's, that's, that's because the kind of returns that VC investments are looking for very often are completely out of step with the a uh, real life opportunity that an entrepreneur might be chasing. So there is a disconnect there. And the second thing is, it's expensive. Um, that isn't to take away. If you have an amazing idea like Facebook that you've got up and running and is being deployed, 
the, the key is to as quickly as possible drive adoption and use of your, in this case, platform. And in order to do that, you need to invest a lot of money in product refinement and marketing. And you need you need you need access to capital to do that. And in that case, venture capital is a very smart thing to do. But it's not always the right answer. And so it's important to think about that. So this is an important point, I think. When, so just to get clear when somebody should go for funding, if we're saying that they people should start without funding initially, you mentioned... Uh, a couple of options, but should people spend their own money? Should people take their life savings and spend it on their own startup? There is no right answer for this, of course. Um, no one is going to invest in your business unless you have invested in it too. So that's rule number one. So I think I think part of the point you're making here is what well, what occurs to me is that people think of venture capital as like a cash machine. Like if you write the right presentation, they're going to give you a load of money and then you'll be in gravy. You know, everything will be everything will be solved. But in actual fact, that's not how it works. You've got to do the work first and you've got to make something that's really compelling. And then you might get some money. And that money is still going to cost you equity. So it's it, but I think people get into this like it feels like easy money. You meet the right person, show them the right slide deck, and they give you, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds or possibly more. Yeah, you know, being an entrepreneur is not refining the art of PowerPoint presentation writing. Seriously, you know, a lot of people think about how, where's the deck, what's the pitch deck. Being an entrepreneur is the ability to use your energy, resilience and focus to to create demand and customers for your product or service. So is it to be able to sell? You know, and, and that's really, really important. Um, of course, putting money in is important. Of course, finding sources of capital is important. You know, should should an individual put his or her life savings into their business? Well, you need to go through the assessment of whether you can afford to do that. Um, maybe you should put in some of it. Maybe you should put in enough to get you to a point where you can go and get other people to come in and share the risk. Maybe, you know, if you're an individual and you're leaving a well-paid corporate job and you have a family and a mortgage, do you want to put that at risk? Do you do you have enough data points to convince you that you are making the right investment decision? Because, you know, your question is an interesting one because an entrepreneur it is about creating a business, but you are also an investor in your business because you're spending your time, money, and energy in it by default, anyways. Yeah, and one of the things you said people could do is get the customer to fund it. So, but how would that work? If I, you're not really talking about customer just giving you funds and investing in your company. Do you mean as in they're going to pay for a, a custom development or something like that? Yeah. So you know, if you are developing a new piece of software, back to your question, could you find an an individual, a group of individuals or an organization who have a need for the software that you have the idea of? Could you convince those people to partially fund developing that piece of software? And, you know, they might get some sort of preferential functionality, early access to it, a discounted rate, a a founding partner you know there are things you can do where you would encourage somebody to invest in you so that you can create your product which then gives them some sort of reward for having taken that risk so yeah there are lots of things you can do other you know many of the many of the crowdfunding platforms have been kind of based on that idea which is you get customers to prepay for a product that has not yet been created. Why? Because it's kind of interesting, it's different, they want to be helpful, or you have something which is uh, that nobody else has. And you've seen, well, you've seen, you know, thousands of people coming out of the SLP program globally and, you know, hundreds in the UK. What do you think is, if there was a number one cause of failure 
for people who went through the program, the people who didn't manage to get something or, or, or were disappointed with their results or somehow, you know, um, didn't eventually come up with a successful business. What do you think will be the number one cause of that? There are lots of reasons why ideas and startups fail. The product's not right. The market's not right. It's not articulated clearly. Um, it runs out of funding. Um, but really, I think at that earlier stage, which is kind of where we're talking, the number one reason is because people don't really commit and take responsibility for having to deliver something. What they want to do is they want to go through a program. They want to learn about what it is to be an entrepreneur. They want to feel like that they've been fed something and that they have uh, grown as a result. And then they continue with their lives as they did before, whether that be trying to develop a product, whether that be trying to develop a service or, or their job. So I think the number one reason is that people don't commit and allow that commitment to hold them responsible for having delivered something, having built something, having created something by a specific time. That's, that's I think, the number one reason why people fail, is that they avoid it. Right. So they're, they're learning a theory by the sounds of it, but they, they're not really using that change who they are and the way they operate. Uh, absolutely. And that's why at, at SLP, I'm a passionate believer in the idea of entrepreneurial education, where fellows who are admitted and are successfully admitted to the program, where they have to take responsibility for delivering a class. It's a peer-led program. You don't just get to sit there and receive. You also have to structure and take ownership. And run, running a class, as you may well remember, is kind of a bit like a mini version of being an entrepreneur. You have to pull it together. You use our material, of course. You can use our network, but you have to hustle and use your own network to get the information you need, structure something and persuade people to do things. And then we evaluate your class and compare it to previous classes and your fellows. So there's kind of an interesting dynamic there. Yeah, I remember I organized a class that was, I think it was something about product evaluation, which is something I'm quite interested in anyway. And we had uh, the, guy, the author of The Mom Test come in. That's right, yes. a little book and we had a couple of other people uh, who I found and I, uh, I asked one person to speak and he said, sure, if you pay me 5,000 pounds. And so that was a no go. <laughs> so, but you find these things out. You have to have, you know, part of entrepreneurship is you have awkward conversations. So I asked somebody who I already know, would, would you, um, uh, would you speak at this event? It's a nonprofit. And, uh, well, before I said it was a nonprofit, he said, uh, sure, just send me 5,000 pounds. He was being a little kind of, he'd obviously been asked to speak free a lot. So he was perhaps bristling a little bit. Um, but you know, you have to be willing that that's, that's actually the difficult work of being an entrepreneur. How many uncomfortable conversations are you willing to have? How many times are you willing to try something and put it out into the world and have it completely flop? And then, the resilience part that you mentioned as one of those three qualities is like, how do you then adjust it and go again? Not just cry in a corner uh, for the rest of the, you can cry in the corner for a bit, but you know, not for the rest of the year. Yes, exactly. And that's really important. How do you keep going? Yeah. And in many ways, your fellows who go through the program, you know, a lot of people join SLP for the educational content and it is world-class, but, Many of them at the end of the six months recognize that actually it is the fellow network, the network of fellows that you have created and gone through this experience with are actually invaluable in helping you when you need help and often when you don't. And SLP runs, is it once a year? It's once a year uh, in 19 cities around the world. Um, you around about end of September, beginning of October is when the uh, academic uh, uh, year kicks off for us. We've just opened a uh, call for applications here in the UK um, last week. And uh, more details are on the uh, UK website. Um, 
so what's the URL people should go to if you want to apply for, for a startup leadership program? It's startupleadership.co.uk or startupleadership.co.uk. Great. And it's actually quite affordable, isn't it? We're not talking about thousands of pounds here. No, it's, it's, it's £450. It's a very modest amount of money. It's a not-for-profit. Um, we're sponsored by Deloitte, Shoesmiths and Approved Accounting here in the UK, and they helped underwrite the cost of the program. Um, the idea is that we don't want cost to be a barrier for great entrepreneurs to be able to apply and benefit from the program. Yeah. And is it, it's not actually not just tech startups, is it? I know we've been talking a bit about that this time, but you, I remember you had a food startup on my cohort and you have other things as well, don't you? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the idea is that we create a very diverse group of individuals who come together for the six month program, 18 classes over six months. And the, they can be from any sector. So any vertical and they can be from different stages. So we've had people who are just at the ideation stage, and we've had people who are uh, looking to raise Series A. And, you know, it's one of the challenges often that we face is people say, wouldn't it be much easier just to have, you know, ideation or seed or Series A or have a vertical for tech or have a ver vertical for consumer or have a vertical for uh, um, medical? But actually, the ability to bring different people together with different backgrounds and different approaches is really is really is really key because it creates an environment that you're not used to and that you can learn from and having that level of stimulation helps you develop as an entrepreneur that's really important to us and so we work hard to ensure that we have a diverse cohort from different uh, cultural, demographic, and uh, 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 different sectors. Mm. No, it's great. And it's a, it's a special mix, I think. So startupleadership.co.uk is the website for that and to find out more about it. And if people want to follow what you're doing generally, because you're also, you do a number of other things, don't you? You're, um, you run your own company, White Cap Ventures. Yes, I have my own advisory business, White Cap Ventures, uh, which works with uh, larger corporates and, in fact, startups, um, and often the crossover between the two of those. Um, within that, I do some work also with the NHS in uh, mentoring and coaching. Um, I'm involved with a classic film business, um, a business called Woodfall Films that revolutionized British film back in the 60s. Um, and... Um, tend to focus my energies around those three things yeah that sounds like fun if people want to find out everything you're doing twitter's not a bad place not a bad place uh there's a uh a uh, small couple of tweets go up occasionally so at at number one it's the number one underscore Stephen underscore hess Stephen with a v okay well thank you Stephen. it's been really interesting a pleasure a pleasure. It's really good to catch up, John. Thank you for making the time to chat. And I've really enjoyed uh, discussing it with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Ideas Lab podcast. Please do subscribe. And if you've enjoyed this episode, it would be great if you could leave us a review. You can get links and details of everything mentioned in the podcast in the show notes, along with photos and video clips from many of our episodes. Just go to theideaslab.org forward slash podcast. <laughs>